slides because I think sometimes visuals help in these kind of complex conversations. And so uh, I really want to focus on why GIFCT exists and where it really is honed in on solution finding. And as a, a former academic, if you are allowed to be a former academic, I think a lot of times our research stops at the point where you say, okay, here's a problem. And then you pass it off and you say, okay, someone else do this. How can we deal with it? And so I appreciate that a lot of the people on this call uh, my fellow panelists and speakers are really on the side of the spectrum of, okay, we know and we research these problems every day. What actionable structures can we put forward, guidance, policies, regulations, if necessary, to do something about it? Uh, it's really not enough to just think about it. We really need the actions and those need to be measured and they need to consider human rights and many other things as we go along. So starting there, why does GIFCT even exist? You saw quite a few people mention different ways that they are involved or participating or helping with the Global Internet Forum to counter terrorism. If you go back just a couple of years in 2017, as mentioned by Henri Verdier, we were formed as an initiative run by tech companies for tech companies in the beginning. So YouTube, Microsoft, Twitter, and Facebook multilaterally kind of made up the programmatic direction of GIFCT, bringing other tech companies to the table. And if you look at 2017, this was the height of the so-called Islamic State online. And we really recognized, and this is something picked up on in the conversation on far-right extremism by my colleagues, Jacob and Alexander, that the problem is both transnational and cross-platform. So big companies were realizing that as much as they would take down signal they could find on their platform, if you have a URL from platform X shared onto platform Y, platform Y does not necessarily know that that link or that outlink to somewhere else or that dialogue leads to violent extremism or terrorism. And we see this extremely happening now with far-right extremism as that proliferates and we see some of the same adversarial shifts. So when we look at solutions, GIFCT started with three research questions, which is where can you in fact share technology across different platforms in a way that does not violate GDPR or privacy or human rights? Where can we get better action-oriented feedback from researchers around the world? And then how do we do better fluent multi-sector knowledge sharing in forums like this, you know, thanks to the German Foreign Ministry and Counter-Extremism Project for bringing this together, but also elsewhere more holistically so that law enforcement can share trends with tech companies, can share trends with CSOs. Now, after the Christchurch terrorist attacks in New Zealand, which were white supremacy terrorist attacks, GCT then had to create an infrastructure around how do we respond in a real world crisis that has online aspects at play. And we see that increasingly there's an online side to how a plot might be carried out. It is still a very low prevalence, high risk format though. So Henri Verdier rightfully mentioned that organizational structure is important. It's not usually the sexy topic when you turn an initiative into an NGO. But the thing to point to is that we really did want to have an independent advisory committee separate to the operating board, which were tech companies, to advise on direction of travel. So as mentioned, that includes governments at the table. That includes the US, France, the UK, Canada, Japan, Ghana, but it also includes the EU and the UN. And that is outnumbered by a number of CSO and academic points of contact so that it also didn't seem like it was just a way for government to push tech companies, but also get some human rights perspectives and some practitioner perspectives in that advisory committee. And so that helps keep us a little honest and keeps us more transparent and drives us to do things in a way that can be explainable and defendable to the public. And when we think of GIFCT members, there are membership criteria if you go on our website on gifct.org, but I think it's worth noting that uh, these may be some of these companies you immediately think of when you think of terrorism online, but some of these companies maybe you've never heard of, and some of them you think, huh, I have no idea why this would be implicated in terrorist or violent extremist activities. Um, our newest member is not included in this, which is Zoom. And so all of these, we need to also, even though focus should always remain on the biggest social media companies, we need to kind of diversify how we think of threat online. And I think Jacob did a really good job of kind of showing some of those smaller, less regulated platforms that are at play. 
a lot of what GCT does is really open and transparent for anyone, but for members, that's where we can start sharing tools and sharing more open source intelligence in real time around crises and other things. But none of these companies are exactly the same. Some of them are umbrellas that have multitudes of different toolings. Some of this might be where you store content. Some of this is how you operationalize when you go to an event. If we look at January 6th, or we look at Charlottesville, or we look at some of the violent extremist riots that are sparked by white supremacists and neo-Nazis, you might see different types of bookings or Airbnb or others being used. And they are also looking at very different signal that goes above and beyond just image and video signal online to see what a threat might be. You also have end-to-end -end encrypted platforms like Mega and WhatsApp, and they're using different types of metadata that they can work with law enforcement on, but it's going to look very different than a YouTube or a Twitter or a Facebook. And so our programmatic efforts really are focused on where is this about prevention, preventing viral spread, preventing violent extremism through civil society, where is this about response in real time to real world crises? And where is this about learning? So there's a feedback loop and it's iterative and we can grow our processes as we go. Now, one thing we can do is also look to other harm types. This is not just about terrorism inventing everything from the word go. And in fact, the hash sharing database that GIFCT manages was founded off of looking to NECMEC and child exploitation efforts of risk mitigation. So since GIFCT, since 2017, we run a hash sharing database. Um, this is perceptual hashes, so it's not housing source content, but it's a way of housing signals that can help you detect content on your platform. Um, and to Alexander's point about where signal comes from and how it looks, one thing to be aware of is that when you get a bunch of tech companies together, the first place you start is an agreed upon list. There are not very many agreed upon lists. Every country's list has its own potential biases or politics or histories behind them. This started with the UN designated list. This is where companies can find common ground so they can hash based on this list. And on top of that, there's a bit of a severity framework they can label. Building off of that, when you go beyond a list-based approach, how do you define violent extremism and terrorism? You have to look at behaviors. So you're really either left with a list-based approach or a behavior-based approach. And after the Christchurch attacks that uh, Henri Verdier mentioned and Yolanda mentioned, with the Christchurch call to action, we developed out a content incident protocol. Now, this allows us when there is a live stream or when there are assets online attached to an ongoing real world threat, it can get its own label and be added to the hash sharing database. That's important because usually when an attack happens, there is no time to say, was there a logo? Does this belong on a government list? The two times that that severity level of a content incident protocol have triggered since Christchurch have been in Halle, Germany, and in Glendale, Arizona, and neither one of those attacks would have been on a UN list or otherwise. And so it's important to look at the behavior and the illegality, and it's tied to violent extremism. We also wanted to see where else, especially for far-right extremism, uh, or REMV, or white supremacy and neo-Nazism, what other behaviors can we look at online, and where can we defend an approach to hash that sort of content? One thing we're doing is including, as of July, we're now building out a way to hash attacker manifestos. So regardless of whether or not you're on a UN list, attacker manifestos definitely trend among far-right extremist subcultures. We're also looking at branded PDF content. Uh, so that's not just Islamist extremist terrorist groups, but some of that siege publication culture content also could go into that category. And then we're working closely with Tech Against Terrorism through their terrorist content analytics platform. And that includes Five Eye Governments, which does include some of the white supremacy groups on the lists. And that's actually about hashing URLs. So again, moving above and beyond just thinking of hashing photos and videos when we think of terrorist or violent extremist activity online, we're building out the capacity to hash URLs and to also hash PDF. And this is compatible with a couple different ways to hash, whether that's through photo and video matching, if you're a nerd out there and like to talk about technicalities, or through PDQ and TMK, which is open sourced on GitHub. So please feel free to ask questions if we have time. Prevention for civil society means something very different. So we also wanted to create a toolkit to help civilians and activists operationalize their own campaigns against hate speech and extremism. This toolkit is available in English, French, German, Arabic, and Urdu. 
So if any of those languages are applicable to you, I'll share the links in the chat or share in the aftermath with Seth that they can share around. And this just helps with that more preventative side for civil society. And then again, back to that incident response framework, this is iterative. And I think even the attacks in Conflans really made us question what allows us to operationalize or trigger actions on the other side. Um, maybe it's not just the live stream, which is the hardest, most low prevalence, high risk type of online content, but maybe it, ought, but it does include things like manifestos or other assets at play. In Halle, Germany, for example, that attack included the PDF sharing of how to 3D print a gun. So we're constantly seeing different types of things that need to be added into incident response. And since the creation in April 2019, we have communicated with our members over 150 different incidents. That doesn't necessarily mean content is involved. It is globally making companies aware when there's an offline crisis that they might want to be aware of because of public policy or being aware of content that might start appearing on their platform. And it starts a conversation of awareness all the way up to when it might mean that we should create a new label for content we might be seeing. And that communication loop is not just with tech companies. It's also something we reach out to governments on. So when we do start seeing online content associated with an attack, we reach out to the relevant law enforcement and government. And we really want to also learn. And so the learning needs to go way above and beyond refined definitions. And so GIFCT funds the Global Network on Extremism and Technology. It's run by ICSR, the International Center for the Study of Radicalization out of King's College, but it includes a bunch of organizations around the world. And since its launch, if you go on the GNET website, it's all open access, lots of smaller blog form insights. There are over 200 insights that I think have been contributed by over 250 different authors from I think something like 25 different countries around the world. So everything from what trends might be looking like in APAC. In fact, there were some really interesting far-right extremist trend papers around the APAC region, but also just technically, how is D-Web being used? What do we see in cryptocurrency? I think Jacob Davey has done some great contributions around gaming and radicalization. And so we wanna support wider knowledge sharing in that respect. I mean, lastly, go ahead and we are trying to tackle lots of different topics monthly with Tech Against Terrorism in our e-learning webinars. Um, but also we are trying outside of the pandemic, we used to go to different parts of the world and really make sure we dig down on how trends are manifesting. The last one we did was virtually in partnership with Ghana to look at West Africa, since we're seeing a lot of different types of violent extremist and terrorist trends that are manifesting there. Um, and I'll share again, if not, not time now, they're the member resource guide that we brought together. So if you go, for example, and try to find every company's transparency report or access to their safety hubs, it can be quite laborsome. So we've brought all our member resources, any company that joins us, we highlight all these different areas of resources that they have open to public so that it's just more accessible and comparable. And to some of those points, it's really fascinating to start looking at transparency reports across the companies and see what they're taking down, how much they're taking down, what is proactive and reactive and start having a bit more of an informed conversation. I think I'll leave it there. I hope I kept to time. I know we don't have much time left, but 